home to yours. Welcome to EMS at Sea Level. Today's guests are Mark and Charles from Micro Art Services. Before we get into the questions, guys, can you give me a two minute introduction to yourselves? And maybe we'll start with you, Mark, and then go on to you, Charles. And Mark, tell me a bit about Micro Art and the, um, the history of the business. Sure. So the company was founded in 1981 um, as actually a PCB design house. And then about uh, 20 years ago, they purchased their first surface mount line. And since that time, we've now grown into nine surface mount lines here in Markham, Ontario. And we have currently two lines in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. soon to be three lines. Okay. Um, but we currently have 280 employees. Um, we offer um, prototypes all the way through to production. So on any given month, we can build anywhere from one PCB for a customer all the way up to 70,000 is the highest number that we currently run per month. Wow, big yeah. numbers. And Mark, what's yeah. your background? Um, actually, I was a PCB designer back in the hand tape and uh, <laughs> colored tape days. Yeah. And so that I've just, I kind of got into production. Um, I've worked in a printed circuit board shop. So I really know all the, all the technical aspects of yeah. building and designing a printed circuit board. Okay. And Charles, what about you? Yeah, so I've been in the industry really, I grew up in this industry, uh, started in the supply chain, moved up into customer facing roles uh, in division and strategy, uh, been in many global roles, uh, times at uh, various tier two, tier one, tier three CMs, but it's an industry that I love. I left it for a very short uh, period of time and had to get back into it. There's just so much diversity and excitement in it. Um, I found myself late last year looking to make a change and really wanting to work for a, a Canadian company again. And uh, I've known Mark for about 15 years and mm. uh, worked closely with MicroWard in different, different aspects and uh, reached out and found, it, found a new family and a new home. And uh, timing was great because, uh, uh, you know, bring manufacturing closer to home fits right in and, and seeing a MicroWart where, uh, you know, serving 280 people, 500 customers per month, uh, has been uh, has been a, a great place to uh, to reland. So. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, and you mentioned that manufacturing closer to home, and I think that's one of the um, interesting trends we're going to see as we go through this pandemic, and we'll get into that later. But let's start with a little bit of sharing your experience over the last two or three months. What have you been sure. What have you been seeing in both of your facilities, and um, how have you? manage the challenges that you've uh, that you've had in your business so i mean definitely the first the first challenge was uh, right around march break or spring break for us canadians many people had vacations planned and then wham cancel the vacation and yeah. then oh what are we going to do at work um with all of the this this media that was happening and um you know the first thing we did was just start communicating um and uh, really put our people first mm -hmm. Um, the safety of our people. So our immediate reaction was whoever can work from home, please work from home. Um, whoever's not comfortable being at work, you don't have to come to work. Let's figure all of this out. Um, commercially, our, our business kind of dropped a little bit in, in March as a reaction uh, mm -hmm. to the news. Uh, a lot of customers said, well, hold, we're not sure. So we, we did that, we held. Um, and then as things, you know, got to a new normal taking into consideration you know health standards and things we needed to do to keep our people safe uh, one for our people but also so we could produce for our customers was very important to us uh, and probably by middle of March we had already seen critical path manufacturing orders hmm. from existing customers so hand sanitizers ventilators critical care units thermometers um, you know, that mentions a couple uh, and then that made us really react and go okay how do we keep production running so we relay out lines we relay out workspace uh, but we really didn't miss a beat you know to the to the needs that our customers had our revenues yeah. fell a little bit but we see a big rebound now um, through June and July after we got you know the supply chain worked out for some of the upside on the on the medical products we were building. So yeah, you know, it stretched us, yeah. uh, but 
I think it made us a tighter team. Yeah, um, absolutely. Mark, when you look at that from a point of view of running the business on a day-to-day -day basis, you've had to move a whole bunch of people around. How, how hard was that? And how hard was it to make sure you got that essential status and, you know, you were, you were delivering those products for your customers that were actually helping in the fight against COVID-19? Well, we were quite surprised how many customers uh, were involved in critical care manufacturing. We, one of our biggest U.S. customers, we didn't even know they were ventilators. Um, so, you know, when that kind of, when, when they told us they were ventilators and said, by the way, we need them now, yeah. um, that really turned on the switch for us. Um, I don't think we realized how quickly we, we needed to deliver and how critical it was for these customers to get, to get those yeah. products out. So we kind of had to do everything very quickly, um, spread the people out, send the people home, set up remote stations for them at home. A lot of them didn't have that. So we had to give them laptops, uh, and, you know, have our IT department set up the laptops. It really put the pressure on a lot of people that I think we weren't expecting to put pressure on. Yeah. But every, everybody reacted very well. Uh, we got it done very quickly and, and it's worked out pretty well so far. Yeah, and, and have any of your customers kind of pivoted in terms of the product or suddenly had a complete shift in terms, uh, in terms of volumes? You know, we've seen some companies that are making one thing that have said, you know, hey, we need to help out over here. So they've switched PCBA production over or they've re, um, redeployed their 3D printing to do face shields or anything like that. Have you seen, have you seen much of that? kind of pivoting of production? A little bit, but I wouldn't say dramatic. I think the, the bigger surprise for us is um, some of the products that we've, we've had customers that are, that are not in the critical path, mm. but are starting to double and triple their orders. Okay. For the, I guess the expectation of when this does come to an end, what they're, what they're seeing on the horizon from their customers. Yeah. And that, it's just very shocking. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I look at this as this triple play of of disruption. It started with supply over in China, uh, and that kind of spread around the world. And then as it hits economies, it's obviously um, having a dis demand disruption, both with some demand falling off, but with other demand for these products like ventilators rising. I think we're going to have so many more ventilators than we need come September yeah. because they're going to be yeah, giving away the like time. yeah absolutely uh -huh. um and then this workplace disruption as well so it's a big change where do you see it affecting you in the kind of short and medium term I know for example you've got lines on the dock ready for installation and I guess that's been delayed a little as well yeah but only very slightly but we're very optimistic about the future here uh, just based on the, the RFQs that we're seeing from our current customers and from new customers, um, the trend we think we're going to see moving forward, again, is because of the isolation from country to country, more, you know, as we've called for years, onshoring, mm. customers we're planning to maybe go offshore are just going to stay put because they can't get over to Asia to uh, visit, you know, potentially yeah. new suppliers. So they're just going to stay put yeah. stay in, or in the U.S., and do you see other stuff coming back? Do you see people, are you getting asked to bid for stuff that's currently being made offshore that people yeah, are reshore? Yeah, our customers are having issues with, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting challenge. And there's certainly some, I think, some anti, um, anti-globalization, maybe some anti-China sentiment that's going to impact where people purchase stuff. But for me to, to do that competitively, you've got to be able to um, you've got to be able to compete there. Do you see digital transformation and that kind of thing accelerating as a result of this to to kind of make make you more competitive? I, I think we've been kind of lucky, almost stumbled on you know, our MRP system is is in Microsoft. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with that, we've been able to communicate very openly with a lot of customers through SharePoint and Teams. Yeah. Um, the one thing that this change did was it made the video conference call yeah. natural. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've been doing it for quite a while with our teams. Um, 
but now we've got our customers up, yeah. up and running on Teams. Before it was just on SharePoint and maybe some instant messaging. Yeah. So that, that's, that's helped a bit. And I think more and more customers are using different platforms. Yeah. Um, the sales cycle, I think, could look completely different. So we're, we're not yet open. You know, our doors aren't open for customers to come in every day. So we're doing some virtual tours. So I've mm -hmm. done a couple of tours via FaceTime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's one element of, you know, digitizing our business a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, we're ready to react. Yes. Um, and um, aren't afraid of the technology change. I think we embrace the change really well. And just our reaction time to the whole COVID thing. Uh, has showed evidence to that. Um, yeah. And now it's, you know, how do we help our customers react and pivot and, and do business in a new way? Yeah, and do business in a better way. And I think one of the things people have learned when they've come back and said, hey, you know, we've been outsourcing to Asia all this time. Let's look at the US. Let's look at Canada again. They're like, wow, we have got some amazing capacity. You know, the ability the technology, the investment you guys have made over that period while China has been doing its thing, the investment you guys have made in, in capital equipment and technology um, is super, super impressive. So it's actually once, once they get used to that total cost of ownership thing, it can be pretty, pretty damn competitive to manufacturing right. markets. And, and, and the strength or weakness of the Canadian dollar you know, north of the U.S. border, I think is raising a lot more eyebrows now. Okay. Um, we can be very competitive with, you know, an exchange rate you know, in the 40s yeah. or 60s, depending which, which, which side you look at it. But, you know, that American dollar goes 40% further yep. uh, on, in, you know, just north of their border. And we're not that far off for yep. an S&P. Uh, board yeah. after hand assembly, yes, labor is going to be a bit more expensive, but we're we're yeah. pretty competitive yeah. just about anywhere in the world. Yeah, uh, up to you know, up to through hole. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and when there's not yeah, when there's not too much manual, I you know I always look, keep an eye on the Canadian dollar. It's pretty much parity with the Australian dollar. So the Australian right. dollar. I right. can normally keep pretty good tabs on that. So yeah, on, the, on the kind of lighter side, how are the team coping with the um, with the lockdown? I mean, it must have been a lot of stress on your on your staff. They're initially sent home. They're watching news headlines of people being furloughed and stuff. How do you keep everybody sane and keep a team spirit? I think it's communication. Patient, yeah. I mean, yeah. day one, you know, yeah. Mark wrote a memo. Day two, we're you know having a town hall meeting. Yeah. Um, day three, we're talking about these orders that we're going to build that are going to save lives and go into hospitals. Yeah. And, you know, weekly we were doing regular communications, communicating again, communicating again, um, and thanking our people, having some of our customers thank our people. So they really knew, you know, the importance of staying healthy because uh, yeah. we did ask our, our people, you know, can you please self isolate outside of work so that you can come into a healthy workplace um, so that we can continue to build these yeah. products that are going to go to the front lines. Yeah, uh, that that helped. I've had a lot of thank yous from both customers uh, from sharing our releases to our people, and then a lot of thank yous from our people going. I'm so happy I know the product I build. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm taking that extra step to wash the hands a little more, to wear the mask, um, so that I get to come to work every day. Yeah. Uh, and what help help our economy and to help our front lines. Yeah, uh, that's that's been a big blessing. I think a lot of it gives them a sanity check too. They yeah. get out; they're not trapped at home. Yeah, and then from your point of view, Mark, it must be gratifying that the team that you built and put together over over years and years have um, have really come together on this. I mean, it, it's just. Oh, yeah. A huge yep. tribute to teamwork, not just inside the business, but up and down the supply chain for you. Oh, no question. Yeah. 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 So what have you guys been doing? You get to, you, you, you're you busy doing all this during the day, then you go home, you don't get to go out to all your favorite restaurants. There's no sport <laughs> to watch on the TV. I don't know what you guys watch up there. We, 
we're assuming you're all watching ice hockey all the time, but I'm sure <laughs> we, we were. We're watching a lot of reruns. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what are you doing? What are you binging on on um, on Netflix or or any of those channels? Mark, let's uh, hear from you. Well, the the one I keep going back to is um, there's there's a documentary on Netflix called Operation Odessa. Okay. About the uh, the Russians in Miami. Um, trying to buy a nuclear submarine for the Medellin cartel back in the 90s. Uh -huh. And it's hilarious. You yeah. would have to see it to believe. You would almost believe it or think that it was unbelievable, but it, yeah. it's a true story. So. Well, they always say that, you know, there's nothing stranger than reality. It's uh, and, yeah, nothing stranger than I just sure. can't write that stuff. What yeah. about you, Charles? Yeah, so we're flip-flopping. One night is game night, and then one night is modern family night. And, oh, okay. uh, so that's been uh, a lot of fun. We missed Modern Family as a family watching a sitcom. Yeah. My kids were both hockey players and there was no time for TV. So our life, our home life stopped, you know, from, uh, you know, rushing everyone around and we got to watch some TV. So the Modern Family has been fun. I think we've exhausted Monopoly and Risk and Mark, Mark handed over a game from, uh, from his uh, family and that was the uh, Ticket to Ride. So we're getting pretty good at that. But, uh, okay, yeah. it's it's fascinating, isn't it, guys? There's a real kind of change in a bit of a community spirit and the way families behave to towards each other. I was talking to um, one of the guys I interviewed in Hong Kong uh, on on this show, and he was saying that there are a couple of elements that he hopes stick around. You know, that thing of constantly calling up your family and dropping stuff off that people need. What have, yeah. what have you seen that's really kind of lifted you in terms of spirit that you'd like to see kind of survive through the pandemic? I think the generosity, um, for instance, our, the rest, we have a restaurant that we used to go to every day mm -hmm. or pretty much every day. Yeah. And now they deliver to us every day, but what they've been doing and we've been donating to them is they've been donating uh, free lunches to the frontline workers. Wow. So, to uh, fire mostly to the firemen and some of the nursing uh, locations. Yeah. So I'd like to see that continue the the donations. I'd like to see it just keep going. Yeah. And that's part of that community spirit, isn't it, uh, Mark? It's that connection of, you know, you see that restaurant as a really valuable part of your 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 community and economy, and you need to keep them going. So you're buying takeaway from them. They. Yep to their business model they're doing something for the front line as well it's just it's just such a nice example of collaboration what about you Charles? what have you seen that has inspired you yeah I, I think the coming together um and you know we we see the wearing the mask when I'm outside of the office you know on the production floor as a, as a sign of respect yeah um, but it's also given us a great opportunity um you know, to hear what other people are doing at home at night. So similar to your question, you know, what's, what's filling your tank a little bit, yeah. you know, when you're outside of work, it's allowed us, um, and, you know, to have more conversations around here. And uh, I think that's gonna, going to continue. Yeah. Um, I think we feel more like a family. Family, oh yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, we're demonstrating a lot more care. We always cared, but now, I don't know, it's more tangible in, yeah. in yeah. many ways. Yeah, that's right. It just kind of feels that feels that way, doesn't it? Um, so you know, I mean, I think the key things that come out from from there for me is that is that communication and that collaboration and that whole that whole kind of spirit of community. It's been it's been huge, guys. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks for your candor, um, and thank you everybody that's watched. And until next time on EMS at sea level, thank you.